Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limit, there are no boundary. This is off planet radio. Welcome once again, everybody, to another edition of the Threat. I'm sorry. Welcome, everybody. To another edition of Off Planet Radio. I mixed up my radio shows there. I used to do a show called The Threshing Floor, which uh, that goes back to the two, early 2000s. So this is not that show. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. Um, the website is offplanetradio.com. And uh, our Patreon group can be found at patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. Emily is away, so it's just me for the show tonight, and uh, what we're about to go into is topical matter that we've covered on this show from the beginning of this show, and it is also so current that we could almost open up a newspaper and read about it, and yet some of the details remain hidden and beyond public, public com comprehension at this point. Our guest tonight is going to take us on a journey of faith from a small girl who wanted to follow her faith in Jesus Christ, entered the order in a Roman Catholic church, um, labored there for many years, experienced sexual assault, and um, as a result of what she found out inside of that institution is uncovered the massive rabbit hole that is um, undisclosed government programs, um, secret black technology, ritual ins institutional abuse, and um, a rampant network of human trafficking that extends around the globe. And we want to welcome to our show, Sister Carrie Burner. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Randy. Appreciate it. This is, uh, as I said, Probably t as timely as the newspapers right now. Uh, I talked to you off air a little bit, and w where I live here in the state capital of Pennsylvania, the state attorney general unsealed indictments about six weeks ago that implicated over 300 priests in the diocese of Harrisburg and a scandal that goes all the way up to the seat of the archbishop and even beyond that, the College of Cardinals in exposing the, the abuse and ritual abuse in many ways of not just boys, but also of girls inside the Roman Catholic Church. Sister Carrie, I want you to kind of open this up tonight by telling us a little bit about your background, how you got to the place where you um, discovered these shocking truths. Tell us a little bit about your background and your early history. Okay. Uh, well, basically, there's been many accounts of me going into great detail about my past. So I'll just give you some thumbnail sketches. Sure, no. I it. wanted to jump into the lovely um, the opening that you had regarding you. Um, the the indictments and so forth that, that were just released. Um, now, basically, my story goes back to having converted to the Roman Catholic faith when I was in high school. And... In 1993, when I graduated, I became Catholic, and following that by a, maybe a month or so, I went straight away into a convent. And after I was in the convent for about five and a half years, I felt a, a deep calling to going into the contemplative lifestyle with the blessing of my order, the blessing of my mother superior, Mother Teresa Benaway. Mm -hmm. She had said, you know what? If this is something that God is calling you to, you, I, I'm standing behind you 100%. So... I basically, at that time, started to, I had to leave the convent and get familiar with how to get a, a base of operations, because I went straight away from high school into the convent, so I didn't know how to do the basic things, mm -hmm. like writing a check and rent and driving and insurance and all that stuff. So then I, within a two-week period of time, I've, you know, I, I was renting places, I was 
at this time though, particularly I was, you know, just basically learning the, the, the basics to getting accepted as a permit because mm -hmm. under 603 in, in the code of canon law, the new code of 1984 offers a provision for those who are seeking to become a hermit. You have to live that lifestyle first. Mm -hmm. And if you live that way and you're deemed as reputable in that path that you're taking, then the bishop, maybe six years later, will come and, and you, he will give you, you know, vows. So I worked towards that end for about two and a half years while attending uh, liturgies or services or mass at St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts. And in the course of that, I had this wonderful relationship. These monks were like family to me, particularly like Brother Philippe, Brother Patrick, several just wonderful people. And they were supportive of me. And I was very young at the time, so I'm sure there's like this, you know, deep respect for a young, you know, a young lady wanting to seek out the religious lifestyle, especially mm -hmm. that of government. So it went from... Two and a half years or so to three years in my book, Divine Challenge, you are welcome to go to the website, uh, www.clergyvictim.com, Transforming Victims into Victors. And the book is for free uh, available on a, with a, regards to um, the, the, the first years of my life up till 2008. I have to, I can't mislead you. I have to tell you, the book is not finished as far as my, my life from 2008 to the present. That is something got that's going to happen. Got it, got it. Okay. Second. So... Divine Challenge is also going to be available on hard copy as well, but basically before Christmas time. Uh, so basically what happened is I have the support of the monastic community, even though St. Joseph's Abbey was a male monastic community, they, there was a relationship where I was under their tutelage mm -hmm. and in particular, you know, through, through their guidance. So one day it so happens that I have a meeting with the priest you know, Father Joseph Chukong, and he lunges out and grabs my left breast in the course of this meeting. Now, I've gone into great detail on several other accounts regarding how it led up to that. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't know he had some sort of a, a fetish with that sort of thing. And then he did, and he, he lunged out and grabbed my left breast. And now at this point, I knew my whole path was going to change. And it was devastating because for me, I used, I did everything in my power to become, like, to have, to do everything on the checklist. So mm -hmm. if I was told to study all the ancient, the desert fathers and the desert mothers and to read all the books like St. Cassian on the confessions and all these incredible, you know, literary works on the monastic life, I was there doing it. I was getting mm -hmm. it all done. I was passionate about my calling. So then we find out, uh, you know, as I'm moving forward, that when the priest grabbed me, I ended up contacting my best friend in the monastery because I was still on retreat there. And Brother Philippe and I got together and we talked about it. And he said, this is distressing, but you don't want to bring this allegation forward because the Abbey will hurt you very badly. And I, I said, I don't take the threats, you know, very lightly here. This is not what I do. And so we talked till three in the morning. And he basically told me that it was in a plan to, to set me up, to have me either leave or to capitulate to, to the demands of, of this priest. So and it ends up going into the court arena. Uh, I lost the case, and, and that opened up a huge can of worms. I was able to figure out through years of study that, that the Vatican was basically controlling Massachusetts state po politics. And there's a case... Uh, uh, Mary T. Jean versus the state police yeah. and shows, you know, that the police were, were going after her and John Conti at the time, who's the district attorney, attacking this woman because she was helping victims of clergy sexual abuse. And she was served as a private advocate. So when this went to the court and I lost the case, it was foiled. This is what I believe had happened, and so I, there's accounts of this. There's newspaper articles, and, and, and it, was, it actually has a lot of good coverage, especially by Spencer Dooley. Uh, David Dore did a very good job uh, on this. So I'm starting to think that this abuse matter is much bigger than just a priest attacking me. There was something more, because it was a rather quick, there wasn't something where he was engaged 
pleasure. I can't imagine it because it was too quick. So there's some there's another dynamic that's come to play, and the dynamic obviously is control. And then I find out, you know, once my my story hit the paper, uh, Carrie Burner or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Joseph Wong, the priest, then it takes a whole new path. Uh, at at this stage, I started to join Survivors Network for those by priests. I was very active in trying to set meditation. You know, you know, so it's it's um, not just limited to a specific amount of time. So there's no limit on the statute of limitations for uh, crimes that are involving sexual abuse with clergy. So, of course, I'm photographed in the Boston Globe or Her- Herald. I forget which paper it is, but it's on articles on the clergyvictim.com. So I'm advocating for all these purposes and all these causes, and I'm helping out these, these survivors of clergy abuse for about seven years alongside with Mary T. Jean. And again, the federal, just so you know, the climate of this situation, Mary, my <clears throat> associate, she actually had a restraining order. They, The federal judge allowed for a federal uh, a, a restraining order to be a, against the district attorney and all state police because she was being threatened. So this was a real case. And so as I'm connecting the dots it's getting into more scary ground. I started, others started to approach me from St. Joseph's Abbey who were other, other victims of other priests who were there. And it just compiled and it got worse and worse and worse. So then after seven years of helping these other survivors, I was completely burnt out and I just wanted to get away. So I went to Texas and I figured if I choose a different life path, maybe you know things will just calm down. Because at this time, I spoke with Sister Paula Kelleher, who's the vicaress for the Diocese of Worcester, and she actually told me, she gave me an indication that I was being followed, mm-hmm. in addition to David Dorr of the Spencer New Leader, who also told me, do not talk on your phone because it's tapped. So if all these people are coming around telling me, you know, I'm being watched, I'm, my phone is tapped, now I'm growing a concern. Uh, so... At, at the point in 2008, I converted to the Orthodox faith, and I just uprooted from Massachusetts, and I went to Texas to get away, and I studied, like, lawful remedies, and I got into a whole different path. Well, within, in 2012, I was visited by the FBI, <laughs> and I'm like, what would they want with me? It was confusing. Mm-hmm. So FBI sat down with me. Years later, I found out they wanted to hire me. But the question that one of the agents asked me was, do you believe that the Pope owns us all through the collateralization of our birth certificate? Oh, my. Wow. That's I, pulling out one of one big, big piece of data right there. The fact exactly. that he would say that, that's huge. And and so I'm just like, I don't understand the nature of what why we're meeting. Of course, it was very friendly. They didn't throw their badges in my face through a very This was an door. FBI agent, is that correct? Yeah, there was two of them. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's stunning. And I had two witnesses with me because mm-hmm. I I needed a I didn't know what this was about. So in, in this period of time, um, let's take from the time of the initial assault to when you filed your lawsuit and that became active were you still part of the order were you part of the church or did you leave as a result of that action actually i was a part of the church for seven years after the initial assault okay uh it took me years to study theology and i went back into the ancient into the records of regarding orthodox the orthodox okay that's interesting and i found out the truth that romanism Mm -hmm. was fabrication that you know in 1054 they broke away from Mm -hmm. the truth Yes. You know, line. Yeah, very interesting. So at the point where these FBI agents have visited you, take us forward in the story, please. Okay. So when they asked me this question, you know, of course I avoided it, um, and I just started going off into another topic. And then years later, like maybe two years or I don't know, I have everything chronologically enumerated somewhere. Um, but basically I found out through, you know, someone who had access that my file was 
special <laughs> and that they wanted to hire me as a, a CHS or a CI or whatever the terminology is because of my knowledge in, you know, the field of private remedies and so forth, private, you know, administrative procedures oh, and things. I see. Very interesting. So, what is your awareness of Roman canon law as it relates to a higher type of law that sits over top of what we would call common law and then obviously statute law? Um, this has been a thread that I've run through for many years because like yourself, I've studied the law in, in certain areas because it's not designed for us to understand. Yeah. So when you begin to unravel it, you, it's like your journey and how things come at you sideways in terms of information that may initially seem random, but then mm -hmm. begins to inform and fill in the blanks of things that you're working on. But Roman canon law, which is the, the law of the Vatican, appears to me to sit on top of the layers of laws that filter down through what we call the common law into statutory law and then all the other special types of law that basically rule people in Western civilization. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm not an expert, but definitely I've done a lot of study in this arena and our country is, you know, very special in that our beginnings, our as, as a republic, yes. we had, you know, basically equity and, and common law. We, you know, it was de it's derived and enumerated in constitution and so forth. But what happened was, as, as you're mentioning and you're talking about civil law, civil law or Roman canon law, because they're interchangeable terms in Black's Law, I think it's fifth edition, mm -hmm. it talks about the definition of civil law. And it says Roman law. So it has its derivative going back into Rome. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened is, is <clears throat> from my understanding, in 1933, we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, passed a proclamation 2039 fir first and then 2040, which basically made the Trading with the Enemy Act yes. something that could be turned against the American people so that the American people domestically within the United States are enemies to the United States. Right. Which is itself so a corporation. That's right. Which had That's been reformed under bankruptcy in 1933. Exactly. And this this reformation, this point at which this occurred, was with the, you know, the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Mm -hmm. So you have the Emergency Banking Relief Act that was passed. You've got Franklin Delano Roosevelt now no longer, you know, basically we don't have, we have a military rule that's superimposed Yes. on our court systems we're not under martial law per se we have a military rule and the book that that really helped me with that was um military law and precedence by winthrop and it's on the judges advocacy general's website the g g g uh j a g the jag if right. you go to their website they have volume one and then volume two and they're separate but it's volume two that gets into what happened in 1933, and it talks about the rights of a private citizen and so forth. You are you are actually right now veering into an area, and I didn't know about those books being avail available on the Ju Judge Advocate General's website, but I've been piecing some things together as regards law, canon law, and what's going on behind the scenes in the country right now. Now, the order that you entered into, am I correct? Did I understand that that was a Jesuit order? Yes, okay. the order was founded, and I apologize for not going too deeply. No, that's okay. Past. We can just inform things as we need to, because you have yep. a lot of material on your website, and you have other interviews out there, and um, our listeners are very curious, and I know once this goes out, they're going to be looking at this too. So... Again, we just bring this out of the news. The recent Supreme Court confirmation of Mr. Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh, one of the things that has been lost in the detail there, because obviously, once again, sexual scandal was brought into the forefront, albeit, I think, in a rather theatrical way. 
to hide some of the detail, but Mr. Cavanaugh was um, schooled at uh, Georgetown Academy, I believe, and also attended Georgetown University mm -hmm. and matriculated from, uh, I think, Yale. Uh, this is stuff we covered in the previous podcast. I'm pulling this out of my memory right now. But one of the things that I looked at in the Supreme Court makeup is the fact that um, nominally three of the present sitting Supreme Court justices are Roman Catholic, all with some sort of Jesuit background. The fourth is Episcopal, but has a Roman Catholic background as well. And looking at the makeup of the court and realizing there's a very heavy slant here towards the church and especially towards what would be the legal theories of the church relative to canon law and relative to application. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how the Jesuits have insinuated themselves into our judicial process. Okay. Well, that's, that's, I could go on for hours and hours. So just keep me on track. Okay. We'll do that. <laughs> no, this is great stuff. Um, the way I understand it is that, you know, if you study, you know, Suits and Chancery by Gibson's and the other great, you know, Joseph story, there's these guys are into equity, you know, jurisprudence and so mm -hmm. forth. Okay. Our systems basically were de derivative of actual Protestant, you know, yeah. se they settled here. So we had a Protestant mindset in our laws, which for the first time in history, it was all about the individual um, in, in America. So, you know, caring about you know, having a, an emphasis on the individual and it's in the individual's importance, but also within the framework of a just system. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not saying saying the whole system was perfect, but at least back at that time, we were not surety for an artificial entity back then. And that's a very important point. We were not surety. We were not being made bank on, so to speak. Basically, that's right. most people don't realize the paperwork that has been filed against them as surety and the mm -hmm. fact that we represent... Uh, my words here, chattel in terms of actual real property that is exchanged worldwide relative values to be traded on the world markets. And this is how they're cashiering us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So is, is if you look at the, 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 the plan, when the Jesuits came in and they, through a coup d'etat, they came in. Mm -hmm. This is the way I believe it, because... All right. After spending many years with my friend Eric John Phelps, you know, studying this topic together. Exactly. There's an intersect. Yes, absolutely. Eric John Phelps' work is incredibly important. Thank you. He's got volumes, and you're going to have to purchase a trunk if you do go to his class because he's <laughs> the first, you know, class. He's got three volumes, and the second class he has three volumes. But it's so beautifully done, and I, you know, in that it outlines point for point how the Jesuits sought to, you know, strangle us and, and at which point they literally took over the system. And he proves it in this in this private citizenship course that he has. And I'm not getting any benefit for sharing about this course. And I'm not saying that my personal belief, because I'm going to review what Eric has done here, is that each person, each soul, you know, living soul, yes. they have to visit between their, between God and themselves and the knowledge they have, it's the remedy is not in a formula. No. There's, there's, it's never going to work that way. It's personal. Okay. Yes. Thank you so, for that. Yes, I agree. And if I share what Eric has done to get his remedy and, and what he's defined as his remedy is separating himself from the all caps entity, the artificial mm -hmm. entity, mm -hmm. A uh, name given to us at birth that was later registered with the state. And the dynamic is that when the name was registered with the state, you know, with the birth certificate, what happened was it's that's not a sin in and of itself. OK, that's not the sin. The problem is, is that when the Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, all those names are seized as booty of war. Mm -hmm. So the names and 
because uh, at the state level, um, it's it's property. So your see everything is seized as as booty of war under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Emergency Banking Relief Act. Another wonderful person to study on this is uh, Dr. Eugene Schroeder, who has free uh, videos on YouTube. But he didn't really connect it so much in with the Jesuits, whereas Eric Phelps, because of his his historical background and his incredible knowledge of, you know, the Protestant founders, uh, he he brings it out point for point when things were changing and what happened. So Eric, basically, he has a decree. And again, I believe that each one of us has our own particular remedy. There's never going to be a cookie cutter way that this stuff. That's works. really an important point. It's absolutely important. This is a template. It is not a formula. It's not one size fits all. Exactly, because you're going to be tested. It's going to be. <laughs> yes, you're in exactly. Front of the judge, you can't. It, you know, they're going to ask you, "Did you write this paperwork?" And you're going to be under oath. And so it, it's it's a it deeply intimate thing, and it's not something. This is very very spiritual. So I'm going to read this to you. In the Court of Common Pleas of Lebanon County, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Civil Action Equity, Eric John Phelps, petitioner, now Eric John Phelps is an upper lower case name, mm -hmm. versus John and Jane Doe's 1 through 99, that's the all caps. And as the court ca the case number 2016-00679, um, and those are the respondents. And the amended decree he was able to get after dialoguing with the judge it is that is is there is a separation now that took place that's recognized by the court um and now this i think it's 28th day of november 2016 upon petitioner's motion eric john phelps motion for amended decree a review determination of petitioner's testimony pleadings and exhibits and upon the absence of any party claiming an equal or superior claim to an equitable interest in the name or estate of eric john phelps that's the all caps name it is hereby decreed, petitioner, upper lower case name, Eric John Phelps, a member of the preamble's constitutional posterity, one of we, uh, we the people of the United States of America, and pre-March 9, 1933, private citizen of the United States, private American national, non-U.S. citizen, private citizen of the Union State wherein he privately resides at American common law and equity, is the heir and sole beneficiary by nature of the name and estate of the all caps. Eric John Phelps stood against all the world. This was signed by Samuel A. Klein, a judge, and that is a decree. And this is his way to make a differentiation between his Christian name and that all caps entity. So each one, each one is going to have their own, you know, way that they approach these matters. But you know what? I, as far as I'm concerned, if it's for honorable purposes, mm -hmm. you know, I don't see how you could go wrong. Now, this is... Um what in some circles is called the redemption process and taking back of the straw man. There's many terms for it. And there, you know, I was in the Christian Patriot movement in the 1990s and did uh, Christian Patriot radio. And I followed a lot of the things that people did and some of the horrible errors that they made along the way. But at the heart of that was these kernels of truth that, that stood out about how we are here to basically stand up now and reclaim our souls back That's right. from bondage. And, and I talked about this a long time because it's been a lot of years since I've, I've discussed um, my background with, with the Christian Patriot movement or a lot of the processes that I worked through myself because I had significant issues with IRS who came in and took a lot of my, my funds and put liens on me and harassed me in paper and threatened me with court and what I had to learn in the process to defend myself and then to offensively move to stop them from what they were doing. But in, I retain that spiritual a aspect that I gained all those years ago. And that there's this, in the book of Revelation, the 18th chapter, it gives us a long list of goods inside of this mystery Babylon construct. And the final line of that is the most chilling because what it says after it's named incense and myrrh and cinnamon and woods and cattle, and it says, 
of slaves and souls of men as and it's mm -hmm. listing merchandise mm -hmm. and when i read that i was chilled by it it still haunts me when i read that how prophetic it is in terms of describing the state that we're in certainly here in the united states but any of the nations that are under the western cabal system every one of us is enumerated as merchandise and to me that's so profoundly evil and it is actually the path by which they're able to do the things that they're doing right now in terms of of your experience and all of the victims that are strewn across the landscape by these churches of sexual assaults and passing around children in human trafficking this all goes into it and I, I suspect that us talking tonight maybe we catalyze something that's going to spark things with people that they're going to understand how this system of evil works and maybe give them some little places that they can go to get remedy for this awesome there, thank god there is a remedy and yes. one thing we have to do is totally you know we can't consent to this stuff <laughs> and you know What's happened is, is they've hybridized us first on a birth certificate. They've made, you know, yeah. they've wedded us as surety for, you know, that's connecting to this instrument, which is a banknote. The, the the birth certificate is is a is a, is on securities paper. So the issue is there's a hybridization process that that's happening. They're 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 taking away, you know our humanity as we are intended to be born under God, you know, there, there's, there's, they're trying to be a block between us and God. You can't yeah. get to this until yeah. you do this. And here's your value. And here's the projected value of what you're worth, you know, based upon this, that, and if you sell real estate, your numbers are going to be higher and all this other jazz. But the, the beautiful part that I like Eric's class and, and there's many ways to do it. Yes. But the way Eric does it is he basically, you know, has you do a release. And I did a release not only with regards to this entity to, to clarify my relationship to this all caps entity, but I also did a release with my relationship to the Vatican. And because by way of my baptism, this is also happening. There is an adhesion contract that's going on yes, with regards exactly. to your soul. Yes. So the way Eric approaches the subject matter is he just does a release and, it, and he files it. And once it's filed and it's cured for like 30 days, then at that point you can proceed to doing other things that are more um, expressive of your status. Mm -hmm. And in particular, going to get your decree, you know, that's going to be an important thing. Now, you don't have to get a decree to, to get your status. You know, there's is my opinion is that there's many ways to do this. I've seen so many people approach this subject and others might do a name change. OK, they might try to express that desire to not being, you know, wedded to this entity by way of changing their name in a very special way. It may or may not work for them. I don't know. To me, this is one of those things where you have to really go to the books yourself and figure it out and, and get the guidance you need from God. So the aspect of the importance of how to dismantle what the Jesuits have done, because they're not just using this to hybridize us with paper. They're now using this paper as prima facie evidence yes. that they have the right now to be able to hybridize us on a physical biologically level. exactly using exactly. their black technology that's right that was a really so, nice segue you did there excellent that was that was perfect well done <laughs> yeah so, so your awareness of this law and then moving us now into the next level of this you yourself have experienced, um, what, t 10 murder attempts. Mm -hmm. um, you have been infected with nanoparticles. You are, for all intents and purposes, what we call a targeted individual on the level that you are being electronically stalked and harassed. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. What happened was, in order to connect the dots a little bit on that, was when I moved to Texas, um, I had some successes wherein I helped a couple people get out of the who mm -hmm. <laughs> And it was a result of all these studies. Now, of course, this technology changes all the time. Yeah. But I basically ended up going through a surgery and I was still leery about Massachusetts. You know, even though I moved away, I still kept checking my website to see who's looking on. And I kept seeing every year St. Joseph's Abbey was typing in my name and downloading radio shows and things like that. So I was really curious why, if I moved to Texas, why would they care about me? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm far away. I'm out of sight. I'm out of mind. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. So I ended up going through a surgery and the long and short of it is a year and a half after that surgery. I mean, I had immediately had symptoms of nano infection as soon as I got out of the hospital, but in, in the surgery went well, I had a polypectomy oh. and some construction in my nose, but I came across something disturbing when I asked the doctor for my file, uh, the day of the surgery, he, he, he tells his secretary to give me certain pages, and I noticed she was hiding some at the desk. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to need those, but just copy them anyway. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to shove it in a shoebox, you know? Mm -hmm. So the lady copied the page that she was trying to hide from me, and I went down into the parking lot and looked at it, and I had a, a friend circle this for me, but it basically says, unknown doctors on the pathology report. And that to me was really strange. That was very, very strange. So say when, that again. What was on the report? It says under the surgical pathology report, it says my primary care physician, the, the doctor who did the surgery, mm -hmm. the polypectomy, the and then unknown doctor in upper lower case. Unknown doctor. Yeah. Meaning there was a on second doctor in the surgical procedure? Um, you're, it, it, here's the deal. I was only consenting to having Dr. Su Chen remove the polyp and do some reconstructive surgery because I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. So this unknown doctor, when I confronted him about this, I said, what's going on here? And he said, uh, you might need to talk to someone else, but in all my years, I've never seen that before. Okay? So... That was suspicious to me, but I didn't do anything about it. I just mm -hmm. kept, I kept journaling, I kept writing, and I kept taking pictures of, of the rashes that I was going through and all the symptoms. So a year and a half later, I'm still, my, my health was declining and I couldn't figure out why because I was eating very healthy. I was doing all the, the right things like exercise, yoga, et cetera. So then I end up, um, doing some research in connection to my uncle's situation back in 2006. And I had my stack of documents on my uncle who approached me way back in 2006 uh, with the concern that he's all, he was a targeted individual. That was the first time I ever heard of that. And so in my willingness to assist him in 2006 for a six week period of time, approximately, I ended up helping him open a file with the Congressman's office and after the six weeks and talking to the Distrito Federal, you know, the veteran affairs in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. they were telling me, Your uncle's not crazy. He is chipped, you know, and this is real. So that door opened up to me in 2006, and I remembered uncle's symptoms. So I was having symptoms that were strange, and I thought, well, maybe I do have some kind of, some kind of sickness that's unusual. So I went back through his file and saw James Walbert because I collected everything and put it all under one file. Mm -hmm. James, he's known to be. Uh, I know James Walbert. I he he. I interviewed him years ago. Yes. Okay. I'm very so familiar with James Walbert's work. He's an yeah. advocate for people that suffer in yes. this arena. So I got his information and I looked up and I saw the detective or Melinda Kidder from Columbia Investigation. She's a private investigator. So I called her up and I said, listen, I tested myself with James Walbert via Skype. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have some kind of chips in my body. 
but I think that the machine is broken. Let's go and test me again and let's get a real report. So she said, sure, no problem. So I prepaid her and I went up to Missouri and uh, did the test. And after three hours, she said, you've got something going on. You've got, you've got a signal, several signals coming out of your body to the environment. She said, it's like you're a walking, talking cell phone. And I said, well, what do you think this could be? Is it a chip or what? You know, she's like, well, you're going to want to go to see a woman named or a, a person named Dr. Hildegard Staniger. I didn't know if it was a male or female or what. So I get to my hotel and Melinda sends my report to me and she puts at the bottom of the email, you need to see Dr. Hildegard. Mm -hmm. Well, it just so happened that I was in Los Angeles at the time because I, I was taking a flight from Sacramento and because I finished teaching a class up there. I went from Sacramento heading back towards to Texas, but they were going to first stop in San Diego. My ears started unbelievable. The pain was unbelievable. They were oozing some white pink, pink, or this pink fluid out of my ears. And it was really painful. Oh my. And I realized, uh Oh, there's something more going on here. Um, I've got to figure out how to fix this. So I went, immediately to Dr. Hildegard Staniger after, you know, I followed all her protocol because she, she likes a, a doctor to recommend you when you go. And so I did, I got a, an MD, a doctor to put together a file saying I'm concerned about toxic exposures to metals or something like that. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. So everyone out there should be protecting your doctors. you got to protect the doctors, <laughs> you know, um, you don't put in the doctor's notes. I'm afraid that I have chips. <laughs> you got to put in that you're concerned about toxicological okay. or something. Now, at that stage, um, I read more of the file and I see more of what my, my, my uncle's file had in it. Bottom line, there was no remedy for my uncle. So I sent him off, you know, said, go to another country. There's no way to get you help for now until certain things change. And so he was away for 10 years. Okay. Now in, in back to my scenario, uh, if I wasn't exposed to my uncle's situation, I wouldn't have known what to do. So I basically went to Dr. Hildegard and she said, you have nanotechnology in your body. And I said, well, how could that get there? And she said, under the auspices of the, um, she said, based upon your discussion, relating to the itchiness and all that other stuff you were going through after the surgery from your, your polypectomy, mm -hmm. this is indicative of a nano infection. So she was trying to explain it. And I said, okay, that's way over my head. Here's plastic. <laughs> can you fix it? She said, if you follow all the protocols, yes, you can fix this. And I said, okay. So I set it up for like several months worth of herbs and I walked out of her office and I was setting forward in my mind that I was going to have this dealt with and done because I couldn't understand why someone would want to yeah. bother with me. And at that time, I didn't know the fullness of what nanotechnology was. It really is. It's a biological. It's a it's a weapon. It's military nanotechnology, military grade. This is not just something that fell out of the sky. You know, the nanoparticles that are in the sky. Right, this was, right. There's Which in themselves are another concern that we all, and we've exactly. talked about that on the show. So, but yeah, yeah these were deliberately, these were de deliberately put into your system yeah. via IV or. Uh, there was a scar found on my jawline by Melinda Kidder. And uh, it's believed that they used a needle to get it to oh go where they needed it to go around so the ears. So they located it into the area of your skull or between your ear and your jawbone. Is that correct? Yes. The okay. entranceway was through the jawline and then getting it by the ears was their goal. So it was basically designed to be lodged in a place where you could be monitored via the vibrations coming from your voice and also your hearing. Exactly. Exactly. So I didn't, still didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> I just knew it was really bad. And, and, and Dr. Hildy was beautiful. She said, you know, the Vatican's did, done this to you, the Jesuits in particular, uh, because of your knowledge and mm -hmm. your faith to Christ. And I said, well, that's outlandish. 
you know, why would they bother with me? It would seem that this would be a pretty expensive thing that they would have to do to do this to me. And uh, she did say it was expensive. And I just said, that doesn't make any sense. But I just kept, you know, taking notes and learning. And so after five months or so, five or six months, I returned to both Dr. Hildegard Staniger and to Melinda Kidder to get retested because I said, I'm going to be your first client that's going to come back through your door and I'm going to be clean of these of these signals. So I did rigorous protocols. It wasn't just Dr. Hildy, Hildy's protocol. I, I tried to, I prayed and asked God, what do I do? Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer. I don't, I'm not well studied. I'm not a, a sonic weapons expert either. So I had to try to just throw yeah. everything at the wall and see what worked. <laughs> so uh, I built a Faraday cave and, you know, to the best of my ability and brought in equipment to see if my cave was working. And I was surprised it actually worked. There was no signals coming into my cave. So when you're, here's the key to all of this. This is part of a remedy I'm sharing with you. Cool. Um, if you're being attacked by signals in order to activate, because they're used to activate the nanomaterials, nano can be, you know, viral, uh, chemical, it can be a plastic, it could be plastic, like DuPont's involved in a lot of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, of course they are. Uh, and they were recently acquired by Dallas and other double evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, based upon the kind of nanotechnology, once you know what, exactly what it is through testing, because Dr. Hildegard has special testing where she could break it down for you, then you approach it, okay, it's time to clean this stuff out. And, you know, so I was basically attacked. I walked away from it with a clean report saying that, you know, a total turnaround in results, that I had a total turnaround in results from following the protocols. So that was a miracle. I was celebrating that. And at that point, I knew that it worked because the gang stalkers were coming back instead of being just simply tracked through the technology. Got it. Got it. Yeah, of course. They, of course they did. Yep. Yeah, so they, they begin. coming back and I said, this is great. It's working. The materials are breaking down at the chemical level. And I was using a bunch of things. I mean, you name it. I had fire infrared. I had magnets. I mean, I had everything you could picture to try to get rid of this stuff. But in my experience, I was attacked, you know, nine physical times and several other threats after, you know, in, in between of all that. And I have a chart, you know, regarding those attacks. But basically, the key to all of that healing is if you stop the signals, and some people would say, well, you can't stop the signals because even if you're in a submarine, you know, it's still going to show. I had ELF, I had, you know, nano Tesla, micro Tesla, mm -hmm. I, you know, um, I had different ranges of things. But if you, you, you at least get into a proper Faraday, it doesn't have to look perfect. Don't let anyone over the house. And you get in there and you stop those signals. There are ways to stop it. Then you're gonna, your body's gonna get a chance to release that stuff and identify it for what it is. Oh, this is foreign material. The yeah. body's supposed to clean it out. Yeah. But it's rigorous. It's not fun at all. It's six months of hell. You have to get into a sauna. You have to drink gallons of water. I mean, cleanses up the yin yang. I mean, if there's radioactive, if there's you know all that stuff, you're gonna have to deal specifically with the exact nano you have. So I'm getting into the details on this because <clears throat> I'm, my heart is saddened because all of these videos that are going up, people are reaching out and they're like, mm -hmm. can you help me? And I'm up till three in the morning and I'm not even finished getting back to everyone. Yeah. For a couple of months, I'm up hours and hours and hours and I feel awful and I'm like, okay, I've got to do something to, to be more effective. I'm only one person you know, I'm only one you know you know so what I've determined to do you know after praying about this I am going to create a DVD before Christmas that's going to outline the protocols I use to heal myself and I'm just going to give the big picture because I was attacked nine different times with nine different kinds of military grade nano so based upon those nine experiences I'm just going to say during this experience, this is the findings. These are the things I did. This experience, these were the findings. These are the things I did. Boom, 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 boom. 
So we're going to create a DVD to help people to be able to help themselves because I am literally swamped. This is, <laughs> no, this is fantastic. You're almost, you're almost like an answer to prayer. Um, a lot of the people that listen to the show and people that are part of our, I guess, our community are in fact targeted individuals. Many of them have come out of MK Ultra type programs. Many of them have spent decades trying to heal themselves, trying to rid themselves of the things that they've been infected with, whether it's um, implant chips, uh, nanotechnology, um, neurotoxins, all of the all of the tricks that these agencies have used to bring these people down because once you are identified by them as an asset or an anti-asset you're on a slow kill program mm -hmm. they're they're very very methodical about this in terms of how they want to bring people down but the fact that you are targeted means you are on a program which which is has a trajectory of very early demise and so mm -hmm. this is very important information and uh, my gosh I just looked at the clock and realized there's so much there's so much to talk about here uh, it's gonna be an exciting second segment for us I think um, so maybe we can kind of wrap this up in a way that uh, where are you today in terms of resolution of what happened to you inside of the order? Um, was that ever resolved or was that simply dismissed? Well, I went to the Pope himself and I moved forward with resolutions to mm. to the Vatican. And it's so beautiful the way I reached out to these people, meaning that God gave me the grace to forgive them yeah. because it's not from me. Um, I did have to pray long and hard to forgive these people. Um but basically what I did was I had several attorneys involved. I had the Our Father Prayer, the Good Faith Request, My Liberties, the Requester's Current Status, the Affected Parties in Confidential Discussions. And I said to them, I'm willing to be quiet. You know, if you can resolve this matter, you know, we will do what we can do to just, you know, bring this to a, a conclusion and mm -hmm. I'll be quiet, you know, and, and not bring this matter to the public. And once I sent this to the Pope, you know, the current Pope, unfortunately, he, there's The Jesuit nothing. one, yes. That's Francis, right. yeah. That's right. That's right. So I sent it to him and I had no response whatsoever. I tried getting attorneys involved. Now you're gonna love this one. I get a, try to get attorneys involved and I had like four or five different ones, like including consultants, you mm -hmm. know, if you count mm -hmm. consultants, five, okay? But Robert Ray reaches out to St. Joseph's Abbey to bring in, you know, resolutions with them. And their attorney calls back and says, his name is Timothy Wickstrom, and says, listen, we'll get together in five weeks from now and let's see what we can do to bring this matter to a close. And I was all excited. I'm like, okay, maybe all we need to do is find a way to communicate. The attorneys ended up either sick one of them mm. was with a baseball bat, okay? Right. To the point of severing his column, his cord. Uh, others, awful things happened to all these attorneys. So I said, you're all fired. You did nothing wrong. You're fired because I'm not letting you die on my watch because right, of me. Right. And I said, God's going to have to figure out a remedy because God knows I'm trying, you know? And I've had several other opportunities to, to bring resolution as far as my approach to doing that and i tried and i tried but for some reason nobody wanted to settle with me and then here's the part that's very interesting right around the time that i was moving forward with letters of resolution and, and non-conflict you know uh settlement these guys are on my website rockefeller group technology solutions and they're looking up my website uh -huh. and it's Peter Grace. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course it would be Peter Grace. Yeah. Of course. So, Jean Peter Grace, you know, is buried up at St. Joseph's Abbey. And so I exposed that relationship that J. Peter Grace was, you know, one of the fathers of MK Ultra supporting, mm -hmm. you know, 
the whole, you know, Nazi thing, Project Paperclip and all that stuff. And here's his, his name is on, commemorated on the altar at St. Joseph's Abbey. And it's like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. You just I, closed you know, the loop. Thank you. <laughs> you closed the loop on how we were going to connect MK Ultra to the church. Which we've all, which we've suspected. Um, a very dear friend of mine, who uh, he's actually a high-profile, I will say, whistleblower, because I think he showed me his bona fides uh, of MK Ultra, Duncan Ophinian, and um, Duncan has a connection to the church as well. That uh, he's talked about a little bit on shows, but to me a great deal privately. And trying to make the connection of how this all works, um, because everything everything inside of these these undisclosed programs is partitioned in certain ways so that nobody has total access to all of the program. It's very exactly. compartmentalized. So, um, but that was very very deft the way you you kind of pulled that together because up to this point the readers, viewers, listeners might go, okay, so how do we connect MK Ultra to the sexual abuse rings that are going on inside the church and human trafficking? So I didn't know all this time that St. Joseph's, I didn't know that J. Peter Grace was connected into that. And it's also the, the chemical warfare issues mm -hmm. too, like, you know, MK Delta, uh, M yes. Delta. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's the best, one of the best books. I found a lot of information about him. <laughs> this one's a good one. Um, let's see if I can find. It's called, If You Love Me, You Will Do My Will. And this is a story written about St. Joseph's Abbey, a monk up at St. Joseph's Abbey, I think back in the 70s, when they were um, seeking more land to build more Cistercian monasteries. Mm hmm and this guy's name is Stephen G. Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth. Yeah, put that up and, there. Let's take a look at that. Is that book still in print? Yes, it is. Well, you, um, there's there's certainly some some extras that are on Amazon. Okay. But um, this is very well done, and it ties together J. Peter Grace right into, I mean, it's it's it. It ties a lot of uh, loops together with the with the Rockefellers and the oil and all that. Um, but the bottom line is, it doesn't just stay in one area. It, it gets off into deeper things. I mean, this book particularly brings that whole piece together back in the 1970s and how basically it's it's the land that the Abbey wants. It's it's property. It's equity. It's all these things. They're not really interested just in the spiritual life. They're into the conquest of land basically through absolutely that's what they're into yeah like this yeah you know yeah most people don't know that the jesuits have been sitting behind the scenes in the united states since nearly the beginning that a lot of the policies that were made a lot of the even the acquisitions of land to the west the so-called western expansion manifest destiny these are all these were all policies that were shepherded through our government via the Jesuits. Most people right. don't know that the Jesuits themselves also founded what became the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, and yep. they were the instigators of what we now call the Civil War, the war between the states. You know, these are all things that I know Eric John Phelps has gone into this. I've spoken numerous times with a gentleman up in Canada named Charles T. Wilcox, who also has done significant work uh, on the Jesuits. So we have, uh, wow, that was, a, that was a bomb of a first hour, sister. Let's say we take a break here. We'll come back. We'll do the second segment. Perfect. We'll do that in about uh, five minutes. And for those of you out there who, um, who will be seeing this segment, Public Side, um, don't forget, OffPlanetRadio.com is a website, Patreon.com forward slash OffPlanetMedia if you want to get the rest of it. And we'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 
You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.